tonight we're gonna, I don't know if y'all heard one of my Sunday nights, but I've been doing this thing called Life as a Christ Follower, um, and I'm going to continue that tonight, so any Sunday night that I do, we're always going to be talking about um, until I, I guess, get to the, I got the more content of being a Christ Follower, but the whole word here is about being a Christ Follower, so I don't think I'm going to run out. Um, but we're going to talk about the life as a Christ follower. What does that mean? That Christ follower, in other words, would be a Christian. Um, a disciple. That's what it means to be a Christ follower. Um, we're going to be talking about the picture of a disciple. So the picture of a disciple. Now, what does that look like? Uh, when you think about a picture, a picture is a representation of something that, uh, like, if I stood here, y'all take a picture of me. I could move over here. You can have the picture and you can look and compare it, and I would still look the same, regardless if I went over here or if I stood here, uh, right back where I took the picture. Uh, in that short of time, nothing's going to change about me. So, you may could even, you ever seen how they take and they'll take a picture of somebody and they can dress somebody else up to look like them? And they'll look fairly close, and it'll be hard to tell the difference between the two of them. You ever seen that? Well, they can go off of a picture and do that. Now, at being a picture uh, of a disciple would be to imitate God, a God imitator. Well, we've never laid eyes on God, but we have laid eyes on Jesus Christ. It's right here, right? It tells us how he lived, how he walked. So that tells us if you want to look like him, if you want to talk like him, you need to have knowledge of how he lived, how he talked, how he walked. And if you want to be a disciple, then you need to be like him. Be an imitator. So a disciple is hungry and thirsty. That's kind of, the, I guess, what would be the title of tonight. So a disciple is hungry and thirsty. And if y'all want, y'all can begin turning to Psalm, Psalms chapter 63. Um, now a disciple is hungry and thirsty is what I've kind of titled it. But hungry and thirsty for what would be the question. Um, you can be hungry and thirsty in a lot of aspects. Um, I've always thought about, it, it's recently been laid on me real heavy, is hunger and thirst, hunger and thirst. Because I, I recently started watching a show not too long ago called Alone. I don't know if any of y'all have ever seen the show Alone. Um, but it's brought it to my, uh, I'll talk about it a little bit here in just a minute. But do I truly know hunger, and do I truly know thirst? I don't know about y'all, but I've truly never been hungry, and I've truly never been thirsty. And Scripture talks about being hungry, and it talks about being thirsty. And we're going to read a few of them tonight. So, I've been having a desire to actually go out, and y'all ever seen those survivors, where they go out and they try to survive off the land for, you know, a couple days or whatnot? and eat what they can eat, and drink what they can drink, uh, try to find water, try to find food. And that's kind of what, in that show alone, that's kind of what they do. And a lot of them go hungry for a few days before they can find food, or they go thirsty for a few days. So they, they get those true <laughs> hunger pains, and they get those true thirst. And I kind of want to experience it just so I understand what the Scripture says. To truly be hungry, to truly be thirsty for God. Are we truly hungry and are we truly thirsty for God? Do we live a life where we hunger and thirst for His righteousness? So let's, let's read Psalms uh, 63 verse 1. Psalm 63 1 says, O God, Thou art my God. Early will I seek Thee. My soul thirsteth for Thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. So as Christians, as disciples, we're called to be God imitators. Now in some ways, this is what discipleship is all about. The, the tough reality is, is that we can't imitate God if we don't know what it looks like. You can't imitate something if you don't know what it looks like. Now, one of the main attributes of disciples is a hunger for knowing God. There is something that is, hunger is not something that you can manufacture, right? We can't make ourselves hungry on demand. 
and we can't make ourselves thirsty on demand. It's something that occurs naturally inside of us, right? If you don't eat, you begin to get hungry. If you don't drink, you begin to get thirsty. It's a naturally occurring thing inside. Now, a hunger for God is not something that we can just create because we want to create it. A thirst for God is not something that we can create just because we want to create it. It's something that the Holy Spirit gives birth to us inside of us. As a Christian, you should have a hunger for God. You should have a thirst for God, for the knowledge of Him. But here becomes the problem, right? I don't know if maybe y'all are like this, but I'm still like this. And I know my kids are extremely like this. When they get hungry, they get a little bit of junk food, right? They fill themselves up with that junk food. Now, if you don't know anything about junk food, junk food doesn't fill you for very long. Then what? You need a little bit more. And you need a little bit more junk food. Okay? We have a naturally occurring hunger in ourselves as Christians for the knowledge of God. But the problem is, is we can fill it with junk food. The world offers plenty of junk food for you to fill it with. The, the hunger and the thirst will continue. And we'll do like my kids and and then my wife will cook supper and go, hey, supper's ready. I'm not hungry. Five minutes later, they're in the snack cabinet getting a snack, right? <laughs> you know, Sunday morning comes. I'm really not hungry for God this morning. Hour later, after church is over, they run to town and go, go to the store. You know, they were just too tired to get out of bed. But they go fill it with the world, something of the world, right? Come Monday morning, same thing. The thing about hunger is, is it's a, it's a reoccurring thing. Okay? You can't ever get completely full. We can never eat a meal that will completely fill us to where we don't have to eat anymore, right? You just can't do it. I can't eat a huge enough meal. So a lot of people, they'll go, well, that Sunday morning is good enough. I'll go Sunday morning. I'll get full on the word of knowledge of God. And that'll last me all week long. I challenge you to go eat a meal and see if you can last a week without getting hungry. Why do we treat our hunger for God that way? Mm -hmm. Too many of us do. <clears throat> now, so in Psalm 63, 1, I'm going to read that one more time. It says, O God, Thou art my God. Early will I seek Thee. My soul thirsteth for Thee. My flesh longeth for Thee in a dry and thirsty land. Where no water is. So the heading of this psalm, I don't know what y'all says, but mine says a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judea. So David wrote this uh, when he was in the wilderness of Judea. Now we can assume that this most likely refers to his time spent fleeing from King Saul. Um, which was documented in 1 Samuel 12, uh, 21 through 31. He and a band of his loyal followers fled Saul's palace under the threat of death and traveled throughout the land seeking sanctuary and support from the murderous king. Their time on the road was plagued with difficulty. They, they were met with reluctant allies and hardships of wilderness living. Now, I don't know if any of y'all have ever tried wilderness living. Just like I said, going out and trying to find food, trying to find water. It's not something that comes easily. Right? You can't just go over to the sink when you get thirsty and cut it on, fill up a cup of water, cut it off, and drink it. You can't just go open the refrigerator and get something out to cook, or you can't just run to the store and get some fast food. It's not that simple. They're living life in the wilderness. If they want to eat, they got to catch it, kill it, cook it. Right? They got to try to build a fire out there to cook the food. They got to try to find a clean water source. Any of y'all know that you can't just go dip in water and drink it. If you do, you, you're liable to get sick. Um, bacteria grows and you know, you gotta go through the process. Yeah, y'all know bowl advisories, right? You know why they have them? It's because the water's set stagnant and it doesn't take very long for it to get undrinkable where it can make you sick. So you have to boil it to purify it. Um, so just a glass of water says, is a difficult process. Okay, it's not just that easy. So this is what they were experiencing. They were experiencing wilderness living. Now in this psalm, David's spiritual journey reflects his physical reality. Just as he physically thirsted in the desert, his soul thirsted 
for the relief of God's presence. See, he understood what it meant to be thirsty. He, he says that this is a dry and thirsty land where no water is, so it is extremely difficult to find water, yet what he is truly longing for is the presence of God. That's what he's truly thirsty for. Um, now the main point is going to be David hungered and thirsted for God's comfort as intensely as he did for food and water. Uh, God's role in his life wasn't just a supplemental part of his existence. Um, too many of us treat God just like a supplement. We'll take it when we want to take it. You know, I choose. I, today I don't need God's presence. Um, for David here, it was an essential part of his life. God's presence was essential to him. It's this, how many of y'all know we can't live without food or water? Right? It's an essential part of living. You will die without it. To David, that's what it felt like to be absent from the presence of God. He felt like he would die without it. He truly hungered and thirsted. He placed, placed the priority of God's presence right there with food and water. Too many of us think we can go all week long without the presence of God. Too many of us think we can go a day without the presence of God. An hour a minute. How hungry and thirsty are you for the presence of God? So David had many pressing needs while living in the wilderness, but his devotion to God remained steadfast. Discipleship is a hungering, a deep desire satisfied only by the presence of God. It's not a part-time hobby, but a lifelong commitment, uh, an essential provision. And we'll talk about how we are seeking God. Are we following Him as casual observers, or are we pursuing Him with intention, need, and sincere longing? Um, too many of us, it, they treat it as part-time. Part-time Christian, part-time uh, imitator of God. I'll imitate Him on Sunday morning, maybe even Sunday night. Mm, if I push it Wednesday night too, what about the rest of the time? Three days a week is part-time. Full-time is every day, 24-7. There's no exception. <clears throat> now, I want to lay out a picture of David in the wilderness so that maybe we can get a perspective of what it would be like to truly hunger and thirst. Um, that way we can maybe better understand how essential God should be in our living. So I want to talk a little bit about that show alone. In alone, basically they have 10 contestants. Um, they pick a remote part of the world and they separate them by two, three, five, six miles. But um, there's always a body of water or a big mountain range so that they can't meet up. Uh, and these contestants, they go and they live, they allow them to bring 10 items of their choosing um, now, say they bring rope as one, they're only allowed so much rope. You can't really bring a ton of rope. Um, so their, their resources are limited, and they only get 10 items, and they're thrown out into the wilderness, and they live as long as they can live. Um, they're not, of course, you don't want to bring water, and you don't want to bring food, because you couldn't bring very much of it. Right? So two things that you got to find first. Number one priority for most of them when they get on the show is water. They look for water, then they look for shelter, and then they look for food. Um, now, what I found interesting about that show is, is a lot of them, like I said, they could be going along and they'd see some berries and they'd pick berries. And they'd pick some grasses. You know, they would be foraging as they were going along looking for water and eating those little things. The thing about it was, is it was never enough to sustain them. You couldn't just live off the little plants and the berries. They all needed protein. And some of them would go 10, 11 days without any protein, without any meat. And the way they described it is, is their hunger was so overwhelming that the only thought in their mind was the hunger. Where am I going to get protein? How am I going to get it? You know, most of them, it, it was crazy to see how many of y'all would eat a rat voluntarily eat a rat. You know, most people wouldn't. 
Now these people would even, this is how extreme hunger had gotten to, they would set traps just for rats, so rocks, and they would come up with traps, elaborate traps just to catch a rat so that they would have a little bit of protein to eat, and then they would cook it and they'd eat every part of it. Okay? That's how hungry they were. Okay, that's true hunger. That's true thirst. Now, does your hunger compare, your hunger for God compare to that hunger? Would be the question that I ask. Does God fill every thought in your mind? Every action you take, is it to get to the presence of God? Because when they were that hungry, everything they'd done was to try to obtain food. Every move they made was to try to obtain food just to ease that hunger. Are we living our lives in a way that's always pursuing the presence of God? Does God always captivate our thoughts? Or how hungry are we? Now while David wasn't physically in a deserted place, he wasn't physically alone, right? So these people are alone. Um, on that particular show, he was on one in a metaphorical sense. He would have felt very alone in this scenario. Though he had some loyal soldiers with him, he had been recently betrayed by someone who was like a father to him. David was thrust from the life of comfort he had come to know and forced to live in the wilderness to survive the king's death sentence. Now, there wasn't a lot of help available to him. Um, again, like I said, he couldn't just run up to the Burger King or uh, Walmart or uh, Market Basket and pick up what he needed. Um, just wasn't the case. Now, if we look back at Psalm 63, 1, he says, Early will I seek thee. Now, in where it says, Early will I seek thee. Um, some translations, if you have a different, different one, may say, Earnestly. I will seek thee. But either way, I, when I think about early, he was in dire need of something to drink. Now, as soon as he got up, he knew that that, and that thirst pain hit him, he knew that he had to find something to drink. He wouldn't lay around. He wouldn't mosey around. He would immediately get up to go search for something to drink, right? Because it may, you know, tell him how long it may be before he would find something to drink. Because it describes the place as a dry and thirsty land. So when he says, early will I seek thee, it means to passionately, to sincerely, and boldly look for something. David is saying that his search isn't just a passive or casual thing. He's saying that his hunt for God is serious. Right? Because he knows that without the water he will die. But he describes his hunt for God's presence as how he hunted for water. You know, he could have got up and just kind of casually walked around, you know, enjoying nature and said, oh, look, there's some water. I'll go get some water. No, he was on the hunt for water when he got up. That's the same way he wanted to be for his hunt for the presence of God. Is our hunt for the presence of God that way? Are we intently doing it or are we just happy to stumble upon him? From the time we wake up, we should be seeking his presence. Um, then it goes on to say, My soul thirsts for you. Now it's clear that David sees his relationship with God as something more than supplemental. He could have said something like, My soul wants you. He could have said, My soul enjoys you. But instead he said, Thirst. Just like the human body thirsts for water, David thirsts for God. See, that's how essential it was to him. Um, now, how important would y'all say that water is in a dry, and it says, a dry and thirsty land where no water is? What's the importance of water in a place like that? Highly important, right? Yeah. You're, you're dead without it. You can live longer without food than you can water. Um, I don't ever want to put it to the test of how long you actually can live without water, but they say it's not too long. Um, so, it would be very important. So what does that mean about David's need for God here? Because he compares his need for God to that. 
So obviously it's the utmost importance. A dry and thirsty land desperately needs relief. Now David, just like the dry and thirsty land, needed God to bring relief that only God can. And I ask you, can you relate to the way that David was feeling? Can you relate to that? Uh, let's go look at Psalms 42, verse 1 and 2. Psalms 42, 1 and 2. It says, As the heart panted, um, some translations may say deer, so as the deer panted after the wood, water brooks, so panted my soul after the O God. Verse 2, my soul thirsted for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Now, this is another psalm where David yearns for God's fulfillment. Okay? So we've seen it in Psalm 63. We see it in Psalm 42. Same writer. The writer's David. And the reason I point this out is it wasn't just a one-time thing for David. Okay. It, if we would have seen it in 63, yeah, it's just one time. Maybe he just felt in that particular situation, that's the way he felt. But we see it here in 42 as well. He felt the exact same way. He yearned, he thirsted for the presence of God. Okay? So David's 63rd Psalm was more than a desperate response to his current afflictions. Um, too many of us we feel that way for a short period of time. Or it may just be the circumstances that we're going through. That's the reason why we really want God's presence. God, where are you? And then when life's going great, eh, I'm good. I'm, I'm full at the moment. It should be a reoccurring thing. It should be a consistent thing in our lives. We should always hunger and thirst for the presence of God. Now, in the, in the desert, and in the fields, watching the sheep at war, or in the palace, David's soul thirsted for God. This isn't to say he was without his mistakes and failures. He was still very much a flawed man, but he knew that even in his sin, God's presence was the only thing that could satisfy his soul's longing. Now, does your desire for God's presence in your life shift based on your life's circumstances? Just a question to ask yourself. Does your desire for God's presence in your life shift with life's circumstances? You know, a lot of, I know most, if your life's anything like mine, it's kind of like a roller coaster sometimes. It feels like you may be on a roller coaster. Um, but does your hunger and thirst for God ride the roller coaster with you? Or does it stay consistent no matter what point your life is? See, there's one thing about God is God is constant. <clears throat> Scripture says that he's saying yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Do we treat him that way regardless of the circumstances of our life? Because that's the one thing that you can depend on that is always constant. I think we take that for granted most days. We know that he's there. So it's always something you can depend on. Um, Go back to that show of the long. Uh, you see a few of those people. Um, the one particular episode I watched, there was always these little snails, basically. I could always find quite a few of them to eat. Um, but they were always after the little bit bigger game. You know, they they wanted to kill a boar, they wanted to kill a moose, they wanted to catch a rabbit. Um, so they would put off the day to go hunt this other stuff. And at the end of the day, they would always have to come back to these little things if, you know, if they didn't get nothing. I think we treat God that way sometimes. Because they, they, just like those guys, they always knew that they could find the little snails and they could depend on them. We, we go seeking bigger and greater things when there is nothing. Because we know that God is there. We treat him as, Brother Jason says sometimes, a spare tire. You know? Um, we got to depend upon him all the time, regardless. We shouldn't depend on something else to fill us up. Because the thing is, is he's the only thing that is lasting. And we'll actually look at that here in just a minute. Uh, 
Well, we're going to look at it now. Let's go to John. Let's go to John chapter 4. We're going to read two of them back to back. Uh, we'll go to John 4, 13 and 14. So John 4, 13 and 14 says, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Let's switch over to John 6 and 35. So John 6 and 35 says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So in these passages, they have a fascinating contrast with David's psalms. On one hand, we have David begging for God's presence like a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. And then we have Jesus promising that those who come to him shall not hunger and that those shall not thirst. He says that he is the bread of life and the living water. Now, what does it mean that Jesus is the bread of life and the living water? It means that Jesus is a life-giving source. Just like bread and water keep us alive, Jesus brings life eternal into those who trust in him. And then Jesus, is Jesus exactly like bread and water? Because he says he's bread and water, right? Is he exactly like, and the answer would be no, he is much more. See, when we eat and we drink, we do so knowing that very soon we'll hunger and thirst again. But Jesus eternally fills. When we partake of him, we'll never need any other fulfillment. So that brings the question, so does that mean that our experience with Jesus is a one and done? And can those who have accepted Jesus give up and not pursue him anymore? You know, it says that ah, once you partake of him, you're full. Once you partake of him, you're no longer thirsty. So a lot of people treat it that way, one and done, I'm, I'm good, right? Uh, that is, the answer is absolutely not. Jesus is all we'll ever need, and when we have tasted the life he provides, it leaves us craving more. Um, best way to put, any of y'all ever had really good cake, really good ice cream, really good, really good anything, right? You had a little bite, and you really weren't hungry, but you continued to eat anyways? Any of y'all? Just me, maybe? Okay. Uh, same way with God, right? No matter how full you get, you just want more, so you keep eating it anyways. Scripture, one of the scriptures says, you know, taste and you will see that I, he is good. Once you've tasted, once you've seen, you can't stop eating. Uh, that's the way it is. Regardless of how full you get, how full he makes you, you just crave more. You want more. The life of a disciple is all about seeking God in all things. Now, discipleship is a continuing process. David experienced God in many different ways throughout his life. He never reached a point in his faith journey where he decided he had had enough. Instead, he always wanted more. Psalm 63 shows us that he still earnestly sought after God even during the hard times. And when we come to know Jesus as our living water, then we thirst for him daily, just as David thirsted for God. We should be seeking God as our spiritual substance. Now, do you know what it's like to hunger and thirst for God in your own spiritual journey? Something to think about. Do you know what it's like to hunger and thirst for God in your own spiritual journey? And should someone who calls themselves the disciple of Christ hunger and thirst for a deeper relationship with him. Of course, if we're truly following Jesus, we should want to grow and be more and more like him. I don't know if y'all ever you know, want some kids to say, you need to eat so you'll grow strong, pick it strong. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the slogan for milk is drink it, grow stronger, strong bones. Uh, you need to eat your vegetables. 
You want to stay small, stay scrawny your whole life? No, you need to grow strong. Yeah. Same way. Same thing applies yeah. when it comes to being a disciple, growing in our relationship with God. If you're not eating, how can you grow? If you're not drinking, how can you grow? Spiritually, you will be dying. Because just like the body, we can't live without food, we can't live without water. <coughs> How do you expect your spiritual life to grow and to live and to thrive if you're not feeding it? Let's see if I can fix this thing. Alright. So, how do we go about satisfying that hunger and that thirst? So if you realize and you recognize that you do, you are hungry and you are thirsty for God, you do want to grow, how do we go about satisfying it? Now the hunger within us is something stirred by the Holy Spirit. But we can foster this desire by submerging ourselves in prayer and in Scripture. As we actively seek God, our desire for His presence grows. It's one of those things where we talked about, about eating something good. And once you get a little taste, you want more, and you want more. Same way with God's presence. Once you begin to seek it, once you begin to find it, you're just going to want more. Your desire for Him is going to grow. It just can't not. It's just the way it is. Um, now, a hungering for God is not an accidental event. It is an intentional process that begins with humbly seeking Him in every area of our lives. Uh, let's look at one more. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. <clears throat> Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So there's no question that if you are hungry, if you do have a hunger and you do have a thirst for the knowledge of God, for the presence of God, there's no question that you shall be filled. It says right there, for they shall be filled. But the issue is, is, it goes back to that whole junk food. Too many of us are filling our lives full of stuff that has no substance. The world cannot offer you anything that's going to fill you up. It may be temporary. You'll be full for just a little bit. I chase that life. I know what it's like. Nothing ever will satisfy. You ever done that? You go in there, open up the refrigerator, look, nothing looks good, close it. <laughs> go over to the cabinet, open it up, nothing looks good. You grab something anyways, close it, you eat that, it's not what you wanted. So you go back, and you're looking in the same places where you just looked, and there's still nothing in there that's going to satisfy you. That's what the world is like. <coughs> But yet we continue going back to the world, looking in the same spots where we've already looked, looking for something that's going to satisfy our hunger and satisfy our thirst. Because all of us have the same hunger and all of us have the same thirst. And it's there. But we're choosing to fill it with the wrong things. So, something to think about. How hungry and how thirsty are you? y'all would please stand and we'll just finish Yay. anything before we close no all right let's go for it. lord i just thank you for the opportunity that we had to gather here this evening lord thank you for the opportunity to do proclaim your word lord i just ask a special blessing upon all those that are here tonight, Lord. I, I pray that you would, that we would continue to grow in our hunger and our thirst for you, Lord. That we would look to you to always fill it for us, Lord. 
Quit looking to the world because it's unreliable and it doesn't last, Lord. Only your, you can satisfy it, Lord. Only you can fill it. I pray that as we go out to the world, Lord, that we would show them, you know, just, just like a good restaurant, Lord, we want to tell others about it. We need to tell others about you in that same way. I pray that when we leave here, Lord, you give us traveling grace. I pray that you just bring us back to the next point in time. I pray for traveling grace for Brother Jason, Lord. I pray, lift him up to you. Just ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You always you 